All right, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you to Stephen for organizing uh, this event and for inviting me to be part of it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, unfolds over the next couple of days. And I'm really sorry I wasn't able to be here uh, for all of the kickoff events yesterday. I was driving up from uh, Cambridge with uh, my seven-month-old daughter, so I was doing a lot of real-time timbral analysis. Do I need to stop? Is that a diaper? Is that hunger? Maybe she's going to go to sleep. Uh, had you told me when I was a graduate student first launching into my dissertation project that this conference would one day happen, I would have been astounded. At the time, I was stumbling around in the musicological dark, trying to make heads or tails of this strange concept of timbre. I was gently alarming my doctoral committee members who wondered if I was irrevocably drifting off into the margins of musical studies. A brilliant beacon of, uh, in this murkiness was Cornelia Fale's marvelous article, The Paradox of Timbre, which confirmed to me that not only was timbre a worthy subject, uh, but one of enormous richness and complexity. Indeed, enough to fill not only my dissertation, but others as well, books and this conference. It's pretty cool to be keynoting with her here. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm sure a number of you upon mentioning to friends and colleagues that you were headed to Montreal for a conference entitled Timbre, A Many Splendored Thing, you might have gotten questions such as, what does the title mean? Just how splendid is timbre? Is timbre more splendid, say, than harmony? Is it, could we imagine a conference entitled Pitch, A Many Splendored Thing? <laughs> I also thought that this logo looked good as well. Or would we argue that most analytically focused conferences have tacitly assumed the splendor of their subjects? But I also think we have to admit this title sounds good. It's satisfyingly fitting. Perhaps it is the invocation of the, I'm not gonna sing here, the 1955 uh, film and eponymous hit song, Love is a Many Splendored Thing. The, tam uh, the title, in other words, invites us to think about the relationship between timbre and love. And we might ask, are statements about love generally true of timbre? Maybe. Uh, one might call to mind Chekhov's short story on love, in which one character declares, so far only one incontestable truth has been uttered about love. This is a great mystery. Sounds pretty good to me. And in fact, the title of this conference um, served as an invitation for me to think about timbre like love. And it's caused me to reflect on my own relationship and musicology's relationship with uh, this mysterious thing that we call timbre. This is the section's called the timbral litany. Jonathan Stern, in the introduction to the audible past, makes a wonderful move. Reflecting on the wide range of cultural theories of the senses, he takes all the commonly invoked comparisons between hearing and vision and presents them as a litany, the audio-visual litany. And here are a few lines of it. Hearing is spherical, vision is directional, hearing immerses its subject, vision offers a perspective, hearing is concerned with interiors, vision is concerned with surfaces, and so on. Stern goes on to critique the ideological foundations of this litany and the various assumptions that underpinned it. In doing so, he effectively unhinged hearing from vision and helped to launch new ways of thinking about hearing, sound, and the specific history of the sense strip away the weedy overgrowth of common assumptions and whole new avenues of research become visible. The very fact that Stern could summon all of these things in this tidy list was precisely the sign that an intervention was needed. It offers a good lesson. In any field of study, look for those things that have begun to ossify into received wisdom. My colleague, as Stephen mentioned, uh, my colleague Alex Rading and I have been editing the Oxford Handbook of Timbre, working with around 25 contributors, many of whom are here today, um, with essays covering classical Greek to 21st century popular music, and we have a wide range of methodological approaches. Here's some of the things that are already out. It's been a wonderful experience to see this volume take shape, and it's prompted me to think about whether or not an analogous timbral litany might be forming. If so, it might go something like this, and this will sound a little bit familiar already. It would be something like, timbre is understudied, timbre is poorly, under, uh, poorly understood, timbre is most often defined negatively, timbre is hard to define, timbre is a secondary parameter, or is it? <laughs> 
uh, timbre lacks a systematic vocabulary, it evades description, our language perpetually falls short of capturing timbre, and timbre lacks a theory, there are no rules of timbre. We could, we could add more things here. I have, of course, said many of these things myself, and I imagine many of you have as well. These are uh, ubiquitous. Our, our, our website for our conference declares that timbre is one of the least understood and theorized elements of music. Now, there are some, uh, this litany has some important differences uh, from Stern's. Unlike hearing, timbre hasn't been caught up in, as one half of a tidy dualism, though timbre itself contains plenty of binaries, as I'm sure we'll hear about uh, in the coming days. Likewise, the emergency of this litany, if we can call it that, is much more recent. I'm not even suggesting that this list is a list of untruths or that we need to put an end to such pronouncements, but it's worth reflecting on some of these and to ask why they come up again and again and what it says about a relationship to timbre. I do think, thankfully, that we are reaching the point, finally, where we can stop bemoaning the lack of attention to timbre. And here I join David Blake, who has suggested that timbre scholarship has begun to coalesce into a scholarly field. For starters, we're all here. In addition, and these have already been mentioned, there are um, a wealth of articles and essays that have come out. Uh, we have the, the recent issue that Isabel van Elfren has edited of Contemporary Music Review. Um, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath for the relentless pursuit of, of tone. I have to admit some jealousy that sounds so much cooler as a title than the Oxford Handbook of Timbre. At the upcoming meeting of the American Musicological Society in San Antonio, there are two sessions devoted to timbre, and I can say Beethoven uh, did not fare as well as timbre. And in recognizing that there's now a substantial and burgeoning body of scholarship on timbre, we can say something else. For all of our bemoaning of a lack of a systematic vocabulary or rigorous theorization, we still somehow manage to talk about it a lot, and productively too. And in fact, I'd want to argue that it's precisely because of the challenges that timbre poses. It demands historical specificity, scientific precision, and inventive analysis. It resists abstraction and begs for critical reflection. Of course, we need to reflect. Uh, of course, part of this critical reflection is because the term timbre is so messy and means so many things. And Stephen has just very compellingly spoke about the many meanings of this term, and here I am doing it again. Indeed, we're addicted to defining the term, stating what it really is or isn't, declaring other definitions are inadequate, sometimes cutting it down to size, sometimes embracing timbre's all embracingness, and sometimes trying to do away with it entirely. In, uh, 1986, Michel Chion, for example, pushed to dissolve timbre. It was for him an inadequate term, a catch-all that actually signified uh, uh, the general physiognomy that allows us to identify a sound as emanating from a specific instrument. That's a quote. He goes on to make the compelling point that the typical description of sound as being broken down into pitch, intensity, duration, and timbre is the equivalent to describing an individual uh, according to uh, his height, weight, age, and general physiognomy, including his or her particular characteristics. For Xi'an, we must recognize the conventional aspects of timbre. What does, he asks, the expression a trombone's timbre mean when one strikes the instrument rather than blowing through it? Xi'an pushes for the dissolution of the term uh, as a referent to source and instead to focus on sonic materials, morphological criteria, acoustic forms, textures, and profiles. So we can certainly try to be more precise about what it means when we talk about timbre. And here I'm recapitulating a little bit. Uh, Kai uh, Ziedenberg and Stephen McAdams' recent article, Four Distinctions uh, for the Auditory Wastebasket of Timbre, I love this title, uh, tackles the slipperiness of the term, pushing us to greater care and precision and to recognize that timbre is a perceptual attribute, as fails, has also stressed. And as Stephen just did, cautioning us against merging sound events with timbre. And again, there's a zeroing in on the terminological sloppiness with timbre. And this again is a little bit of a recapitulation. It is misleading to suggest that one sound producing object or instrument uh, yields exactly one timbre. Contrary to the parlance of the bassoon timbre, there is no single timbre that fully characterizes the bassoon. The timbre of bassoon depends on pitch, playing effort, articulation, fingering, etc. Now this passage brought to mind an essay on tone by the early romantic philosopher Wilhelm Wachenroder. 
In it, he addressed the analogies that were being made in the 18th century between tones and colors, and in particular, the notion that single colors could be paired with tones to create an instrument like the ocular harpsichord, something he felt was totally unproductive. Instead of this kind of pairing, pitch equals a particular color, he pushed for a different way of thinking about sound and color, writing each individual tone of a particular instrument is like the nuance of a color. Now, without invoking the term timbre, Wachenroder recognized that each tone of an instrument has its own specific qualities. But then he continues, and just as each main color has a main color, so too each instrument possesses, or each instrument has only one completely characteristic tone that it best expresses. So here he departs. The no this notion of one completely characteristic tone is the equivalent, I would say, to the timbre of a bassoon. And the thing is, it's not a meaningless statement. He draws on what we might call the cumulative imaginary of timbre. Sure, we might get it wrong when we identify sources, but that's not bad. It's actually simply revealing, is what I would want to say. In fact, generalizations about the timbre of an instrument, and not just the timbre of, of a particular specific instrument, but generalizations about the timbre of a species of instrument or even instrument families are not only ubiquitous, but they're meaningful and productive. They fuel not only orchestration treatises, but broader discourses about music. In fact, one might even say this generalizability, this sloppiness, is the precondition or inauguration of the modern concept of timbre. To talk about timbre is often to talk about the general sound of an instrument rather than the specific sonic experience of a particular and singular performance. Rousseau, for example, defined timbre as the sound's harshness or softness, its dullness or brightness. Soft sounds like those of the flute ordinarily have little harshness. Bright sounds are often harsh, like those of the viol or oboe. We could go even further and say there is something paradoxical or oxymoronic about the concept of timbre. It enters discourse as a name for the immediacies of sonic experience, but the very process of naming that experience allows us to speak in, general, in generalities about those immediacies. But of course, now I'm talking about paradoxes and we're brought right back to Fail's 2002 essay. And I start to wonder if there's anything I can say that goes beyond what she's already said. I linger on this because I wanna preserve the messiness of the term timbre, and to remind us the ways in which it carries a rich history that cannot be rationalized away. We can and should be more specific when we need to be, and certainly timbre is difficult to define, and most definitions fall short in some way, depending on what questions we want to ask and what we want to do with timbre. But this also means we can endlessly, eternally, take pleasure in critiquing each other's definitions and rebuilding timbre in different guises. And it also means this messiness is very much part of its history. Part of my preoccupation with the messiness of timbre reflects my own changing relationship to it. My love affair, I'm gonna to return to love here, uh, began uh, with the concept itself. First, I was interested in the idea, as I've already hinted at, that we could think about the concept historically, or rather that the concept had a history and there was a time before timbre and a period of coming into being. There's a thrill to discovering histories to things we might think of as timeless. And like anyone in love, I felt giddy, moving in a world with less gravity. And in those early days of love, it just got better and better. Once attuned to timbre, it became a kind of key to thinking about enlightenment and listening. The birth of timbre as a concept corresponded to much broader shifts in the history of aesthetics, to radical transformations into how people thought about instrumental sounds, its meaning, and its effect. In my book, um, I became um, particularly interested in thinking about timbre in relation to the history of the orchestra and how the consolidation and standardization of the orchestra during the second half of the 18th century gave rise to the modern practice of orchestration, though the practice wasn't yet named that. And with this came new ways of conceiving of and writing about instrumental character. This is something I traced through the music of, of Haydn, whose career and engagement with the orchestra mirrored in powerful ways the broader development of the orchestra. It was illuminating. Once attuned to Haydn's orchestra, it became clear that his audiences were likewise thrilled by instrumental effects. Uh, after his second concert in London, the Morning Chronicle reported uh, that about the symphony that had been performed the night before, every instrument is respected by his muse, and he gives to each its due proportion of efficacy. He does not elevate one and make the rest contributory as mere accompaniment, but the subject is taken up by turns with masterly art, and every performer has the means of displaying his talent. This idea of praising the sort of social aspect of, of Haydn's orchestration. 
Even when I attempted very basic representations of Haydn's orchestral works, I found it revealing in its results. His audiences loved his slow movements, uh, and if you do these uh, sort of orchestrational contours, it, it helps show why they were packed with extreme contrasts of color and dynamics. I recap some of my work here to highlight the element of straightforwardness about it. It was all a matter of thinking about an element that had been previously understudied, a refocusing of attention. Let's think about orchestration and timbre instead of those other more frequently studied things like form, harmony, phrase, structure, all of that stuff. Timbre was everywhere, lurking, waiting to be patiently rediscovered, to be revealed in all of its splendor. As I've continued to think about timbre listening and orchestration in the 18th century, I've started to pine for approach that could both take account of timbral issues while also acknowledging that it was often unnamed, that a way that could embrace its messiness, and that did not fight back against the ways in which timbre could be brushed aside in musical discussions. That is, one of the premises of tam timbre studies today is that we've ignored timbre at our own peril. But what if playing fast and loose with timbre is actually productive? And here I'd like to shift gears and go back into the 18th century with a little bit more gusto. Actually, I want to go into the early 19th century. There are two passages in E.T.A. Hoffman's short story, Ritter Gluck, that have long intrigued me. Written and set in 1809 and published in the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, the short story was one of Hoffman's first, and it helped launch his career as a writer. The very short story tells the, uh, of the narrator's repeated encounters in Berlin with a mysterious stranger, and their conversations, quite fantastical, about music. The two first meet in a cafe where a motley little ensemble, a harp, two violins, flute and bassoon, are playing, or rather torturing, some music. The narrator listening to this cries out in pain, parallel octaves, drawing the attention of the stranger who's delighted to find another music appreciator. The narrator explains that he had had some musical education in piano and figured bass, and had learned that parallel octaves were a bad thing. Really, the stranger replies, and then convinces this little motley quintet to perform the overture to Gluck's uh, 1774 opera, Iphigenie and Olide. As the musicians play, the stranger enters a trance. He breathed in deep gasps and drops of perspiration appeared on his brow, Hoffman writes. He signaled the tutis and climaxes, his right hand never missing a beat, while with his left, he drew out a handkerchief and mopped his brow. But most marvelously in what drew me to this story is the transformation that happens as the quintet plays. How he enlivened that skeleton of an orchestra with fresh color. I heard the soft melting figure with which the flute ascends after the storm of violins and uh, basses has abated and the thunder of the timpani is silenced. I heard the gentle rippling of tones of the cellos and bassoons and my head was filled with inexpressible melancholy. The tutti returned like a giant and the unison cried out majestically, overwhelming the musty sounds with its crusty climax. Hoffman's literary staging of the scene uh, echoes the remarkable performance he describes. Just as the narrator hears cellos and basses that are not there, the reader is likewise invited to imagine the original overture, which you just heard a snippet of. The meager quintet of musicians transforms both for the narrator and the reader into a full-fledged orchestra with all of its dramatic power and expressivity. At the end of the story, after the stranger gives a remarkable piano performance of some of Gluck's music, the narrator finally asks him who he is. I am Gluck, is the impossible and solemn reply. Gluck had died in 1787. As one might imagine, this story has drawn lots of scholarly attention and has been interpreted to a number of different ends. Hoffman's Gluck has been seen as a madman, a crazed ghost, a sign of excess, a manifestation of Hoffman's own compositional anxieties, and a reincarnation of Rameau's nephew. But what originally drew me to this story were the ways in which it's about the representation of orchestral sound. Later in the story, when the stranger plays piano for the narrator, he imitates the sounds of the instruments with his voice, which quite impresses the narrator. Hoffman references 
very real and well-known pieces of music, and he invites the reader to engage her own timbral imagination as she reads. And like the Café Quintet, it's all approximate and attenuated, but it doesn't exactly detract from the vividness of the experience. The tension between the real and the imagined sonorities actually drives the narrator's curiosity and wonder, and perhaps our own as well. This tension leads me to another aspect of Ritter Gluck. Like many pieces of Hoffman's writing, it is both a fantastical story and also an intervention into the musical debates of his time, or in this case, the musical debates of the previous generation. Iphigenie en Olide was a much beloved opera and its overture was particularly celebrated and discussed during the 18th century. As Ricardo Schmidt and Francian Marx have noted, the initial exchange between the narrator and the stranger about parallel octaves was a reference to the music theorist and Bach biographer Johann Nicholas Forkel's feisty criticisms of Gluck's music that had circulated since the 1770s. Forkel had published a withering critique of Gluck, stating that Gluck's music resembled the musical style of our tavern virtuosos, a style that was at once, uh, that was simple enough, but at the same time quite disgusting. Forkel did not like the overture, Forkel especially did not like this overture. The unison that had cried out so majestically for Hoffman's narrator was too insignificant a moment for Forkel to warrant such a grand treatment. Uh, and here he, one, a little snippet from his essay. We find nothing praiseworthy in bringing in the instruments suddenly on one note and then having them rise to the octave above this note. A passage in which all the instruments sound in unison must have a certain degree of importance. If it has no particularly important or interesting content, then it is inappropriate to give it to all the instruments in unison, thereby endowing it with an unearned splendor. This is a fascinating critique, and one that I want to argue points to a fundamental transformation in the history of listening. This is unlike later criticisms of orchestration that focus more explicitly on questions of noise or instrumental abuse, that is, mis uh, misusing the characters of instruments. You shouldn't have the flute playing loud, it's gentle. You see this all the time later in the 18th century. Rather, we might say Forkel is not listening orchestrally. That is, what he's doing is he's listening for musical thoughts that are worthy, which can then be rendered uh, important and highlighted through their instrumental treatment. In other words, for Forkel, the splendor and significance must lie somewhere other than the instrumental treatment. Hoffman's imagined performance of the music in his story treats the orchestration as the higher reality of the piece. To imagine the orchestra, to, sorry, to imagine the overture is to hear the full orchestra, and the power of that overture lies precisely in its orchestral reality. I'm drawn to Gluck for several reasons, and not just because of the story. Part of it, I admit, is guilt. As I worked on my first book, Gluck was often mentioned alongside Haydn, and it makes sense, like Haydn, uh, Gluck, uh, and his music circulated uh, around uh, Europe during the 18th century. In fact, Gluck circulated much more than Haydn. His career took him from Italy to England, uh, and uh, Vienna and Paris. He adapted his Italian works for the Viennese stage and for the French stage, and his works existed in many translations. And many later composers, Berlioz, Wagner, Mahler, have all cited Gluck as an influence and inspiration and been intrigued by his music. But looking at Gluck tells another story of uh, timbre and orchestration in the 18th century. And here I want to make two closely related arguments. First is that the shift in listening between Forkel and Hoffman's writing points to an important aspect of Gluck's operatic reforms, namely that they hinged on a particular way of deploying his orchestra in relation to the vocal parts. And second, uh, that the basic spirit of his reforms, which I'll talk to about a little bit more, suppressed the role of the orchestra. And the suppression was, in fact, both necessary and reflected a mode of listening, uh, a mode of listening that's second nature to us today, but was difficult for some listeners in the 18th century who struggled with Gluck's music. In thinking about Gluck and the orchestra, I'm revisiting familiar territory. It's been noted since Gluck's lifetime that he had a special touch when it came to his treatment of instruments, and after Gluck's death, writers on music often invoked Gluck and his treatment of the orchestra when critiquing newer composers. Gluck's operas served as models of uh, orchestra, uh, orchestral elegance to be emulated, and they stood in contrast to newer operas that overused and abused instruments. So we could have, in 1799, the composer Johann Wesley um, saying in the works of our uh, new masters, all the recitatives, even insignificant moments, are all accompanied by wind instruments of all kinds. 
Only Gluck alone has, by and large, been able to remain unsullied by this musical extravagance. So he's the one who should be followed. Praise like this continued through the 19th century. Uh, Berlioz's orchestration treatise is peppered with examples drawn from Gluck's scores. He turned to Gluck to illuminate tremolos, the uses of mutes, uh, grace notes, the power of the viola and the oboe, and effective uses of the piccolo and even the cymbal. Sublime tends to be Berlioz's descriptor of choice. But there's something that has often struck me. Discussions of Gluck's orchestral skills often happens quite separately from discussions of his operatic forms, for reforms for which he's primarily remembered today. These reforms were about, as the story goes, putting music in its place. Uh, in the, the celebrated uh, preface to Alcesta, written in 1767, the, the second of the so-called reform operas, Gluck and his librettist Kalsabigi stated their intention to restrict music this is a quote, uh, to its true function of serving the poem in the expression and in the situations of the story without interrupting the action or cooling it down with useless, superfluous ornaments. Gone are useless orchestral ritinelli or pauses on favorable values for the purposes of showing off a vocal nimbleness and uh, unnecessary repetitions designed for the singer to show off the many ways he can capriciously vary a passage. When talking about Gluck's operatic reforms, we often hold up Orfeo's celebrated entrance, his three plaintive cries of Eurydice, as encapsulating the essence of the simplicity that Gluck so prized. Orfeo does not express his grief about the loss of his wife by singing an aria that describes his inner, inner tempests. Rather, his, his exclamations are the very manifestation of barely articulate grief. As Taruskin so elegantly puts it, it's hard to conceive of anything more elemental, more drastically reduced to essentials. And here's just a tiny bit of the score with one of Orfeo's cries. But of course, the scene is hardly that simple or even natural, for how many of us have grieved to the accompaniment of a four-part chorus, a pair of cornettos, three trombones, strings, and continuos. Here's the full score. Here's a little... Oh. The power of Orfeo's exclamations stem as much from their directness as it does from the awe and drama of the larger musical context. The sorrowful orchestra and chorus create a massive sound, an orchestral universe in which these bare, exposed tones can assume meaning. The idea of natural and direct expression that Gluck, artic Gluck articulated is achieved precisely by having the accompaniment assume a larger, indeed essential role in shaping the expressive content. This was not lost on Gluck's contemporary audiences. The novelist and jurist uh, uh, Joseph uh, von Sonnenfels, most, oftenly, uh, most often invoked in musicological contexts as a patron of Mozart, published extensively on the Viennese stage and moral uh, national issues surrounding it. When he first heard Alcesta, he wrote rapturously about the work. It was full of a kind of Germanic masculine power that had real moral power, far superior to Italian opera, which for him spoke only to the ear and not to the heart. Listening to Alcesta, von Sonnenfels found himself in the land of miracles. And he writes, I'm not going to read this entire quote, Alcesta provided this gifted man with a spacious canvas on which to show the fertility of his thought. Its accompaniment is not a simple dry harmony or futile filling up of spaces, but an essential part of the expression, and so often so in integrally expressive that it makes the whole content comprehensible, rendering the words almost superfluous. This is actually quite a radical uh, reaction to have to Alcesta. Zonenfels locates the power of the opera not just uh, in the reformed singing style and its beautiful simplicity, which he approves of, but in the power of the chorus and especially the accompaniment. The idea that the words should be almost superfluous uh, runs counter to the basic principles of Gluck's reforms. And yet it underscores what we already saw in Orfeo. It's crucial that the orchestra take on, in Zonenfeld's words, the essential part of the expression. And if we look at other contemporary accounts, we find again and again this idea that one needs to learn to listen to Gluck's music. One of uh, Gluck's uh, Parisian supporters, Francois Arnaud, published several pieces on Gluck's music, often drawing attention to Gluck's use of the orchestra. In the 1774 letter, written after the premiere of Iphigenie Ephig in Olide, he writes, listen to the overture. Observe how, having 
bound uh, the opening of, its, uh, of it to the subject, not by vague connections, but by the very structure, the composer suddenly brings in all the instruments on the same note. How, after having climbed in, uh, in unison to the octave above this note, the instruments separate and converge, each one independent of the rest, in order to prepare the mind for the great event. What I'm drawn to here, this is the same passage that Forkel was de describing, what I'm drawn to here is the uh, pedagogical tone. Listen to this. Observe these elements. Here's what they're doing emotionally. This pedagogical imperative is even more apparent in Arnaud's later well-known essay, uh, uh, evening, The Evening Lost at the Opera, in which he placed himself at a performance of Gluck's Alces, defending Gluck's works against those who had pestered him and prevented him from attending the drama. How come Iphigenie and Orphée did not lead you to listen more attentively to the orchestra? Such an indifference is only pardonable in all your other operas where, a very small number accepted, the instruments accompany the voice as a valet accompanies his master, not as the arms, hands, and eyes, facial and body movements accompany the language and feeling of passion. Gluck's reforms not only required a more robust role of the orchestra, but also, and this is the crucial point, the ability to listen to the orchestra in a very particular way. It demands that we hear the orchestra as a form of what we might call, following Stanislavski, a dramatic subtext performing a wide range of roles, emotional and scenic. Forkel's criticisms reflect, I would argue, a resistance to this way of listening, uh, an inability to hear the orchestra as a kind of subtext. By and large, we do this completely naturally today. It's the bread and butter of film scoring, whereby subliminal orchestras tell us what the characters are feeling. We might think of this as Wagnerian, but its origins are here in the world of Gluck, and here's where we see people learning how to do this kind of listening. Let's look, at, let's look at one more example, an aria from Alcesta. Admetus the king is at death's door, and the people of Thessaly are distraught, both for the king and their uncertain future. A plan is made to approach the oracle at the temple of Apollo to bring gifts to make a sacrifice. In scene two, Alcesta emerges from the palace, equally troubled, to address the people and to offer her solidarity with the hope uh, that the vision of a grieving kingdom might uh, placate the gods. Her aria that follows um, is this one, and let's just give a listen to this and see what we make of it, and then I'll carry on. Mm -hmm. 
this aria invokes a wide range of emotions, a hope for divine pity, feelings of terror, maternal love, and Gluck's setting forefronts this emotional range by drawing on uh, contrast between serene and stormy orchestral textures. It begins with a plaintive oboe soaring over sweet pizzicato violins, cellos, and basses, conjuring up an image of total serenity that Alcesta knows to be impossible. Her hope for a ray of pity is accompanied by legato strings and bassoon, an altogether more earthly normative orchestral texture. This gives way in turn to more agitated texture with driving eighth notes in the strings and her children interrupt her to, to remind her of the gods of mercifulness accompanied by English horn, bassoon, and divisi violas, once again infusing everything with sweetness and then everything re becomes more agitated uh, once uh, uh, Elchester returns with her fears for her children. This is a totally mundane analysis that I'm giving. I'm simply describing the unfolding of the instrumental textures and how they correspond to the text. But it's also a powerful demonstration of Gluckian reforms at work. The musical setting conforms to each nuance of the many emotions Alcesta experiences over the course of the aria. For listeners, accompanied, uh, for listeners accustomed to hearing the orchestra sonifying characters' internal emotional states, it's pretty straightforward to hear and understand this aria as amplifying and dramatizing Alcesta's inner turmoil. But hearing the aria this way takes practice, and the criticisms received in the 18th century are revealing in this. Um, in 1777, uh, Rousseau sketched out a critique uh, of the opera at Gluck's request. Rousseau did say a number of very positive things, but he was also quite critical, and his criticisms largely focused on two things, Gluck's use of the orchestra and the question of musical and dramatic coherence. Uh, in general, Rousseau advocated for a, a, a more unremarkable use of accompaniment in recitatives, arguing that more minimal accompaniment allows the ears of the listener to rest, as well as the orchestra to rest, and it prevents the music from becoming overwhelming. So he goes and uh, points out places where it would have been better to have the orchestra drop out. Then he goes on to discuss this aria. He said, it seems very beautiful to me. I'd have only desired that the expressions in it did not have to be uh, varied by different meters. Two, when they are necessary, can form agreeable contrast, but three, this is too many, and this breaks the unity. Where in this aria is the unity of design, of portraiture, of character? No, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is not at all, it seems to me, an aria, but a succession of several arias. No common design can be shown in this piece that connects it and makes a unified whole. If we go back to our friend Forkel, we find actually pretty similar things. He singled out this aria as an exemplative, as exemplative of Gluck's typical faults. He actually didn't find it terrible. Um, like Rousseau, he rather liked the beginning, but he was nonplussed by the constant changing of textures and tempos. And he complains, the accompaniment is also well thought out, especially at the beginning, but scarcely has one passage been enjoyed, then it is superseded by another. So that at the end, little or no overall impression remains. This criticism can be applied to many other arias. Again, this aria makes sense, it coheres, if we expect to hear the orchestra as a subtle, real-time reflection of a character's changing emotional state. But if one anticipates that the orchestra will behave as the valet following around his master, one might hear the accompaniment as impatient and unfocused. And of course, there's actually a chance that we today might agree with Rousseau and Forkel and think that this is a little bit unfocused. And to do so is to comprehend um, the experimental nature of Gluck's reformed operatic style. This was, we have to understand this as a kind of um, avant-garde and experimental uh, mode that he's, that he's testing out here, even if calling Gluck avant-garde at this conference seems very, very old-fashioned when a lot of people talk about much more contemporary stuff than this. Uh, let's reflect um, on and so a way to sort of start moving towards a conclusion here. I'd like to reflect on the disciplining move that lies at the very heart of Gluckian operatic reforms. There's a necessary tension between the natural expression that highlights the importance of the voice and words on the one hand, and the, on the other hand, the, the greater and more involved use of the orchestra for a vehicle for expression. The resolution to this uh, tension lies in the sublimation of orchestral sound. The music gives the illusion of being subservient to the words while simultaneously ex functioning as the expressive force that imbues the text with its dramatic meaning. It is essential, but it pretends to be unspoken. 
This means that Tambor's status as something to be overlooked, understudied, is, uh, and perhaps taken for granted, is programmed into its modern use. But let's take a step back and ask a few questions at this point. Is this a story about Tambor? I'm not entirely sure. I do know it's a story that I can tell because I'm attuned to questions relating to orchestral sound and how it was experienced. It's not not about timbre. It's just that it doesn't quite make sense to isolate timbre from everything else that we're talking about, text music relations, harmony, accompanimental techniques, texture, vocal lines, and so on. To talk about timbre here would be to discipline something that's quite unruly. But let's go back to our conference's title. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the film Love is a Many Splendored Thing. It tells the story of an American reporter who falls in love with the Eurasian doctor Han Su Yin, and it was based on the semi-autobiographical novel by Elizabeth Comer. In the film, Han Su Yin was played by Jennifer Jones in, in Yellow Face, and if we recoil at this example of Hollywood's colonizing attitudes, a shockingly persistent one at that, perhaps we can take a final lesson from this discomfort. We can be sensitive to the ways in which the term timbre is not culturally neutral. It carries with it its own colonizing potential. The concept of timbre drags along with it a history of listening and a history of musical values. There is, and I'd be the first to celebrate this, a liberation into talking about timbre. But there's also a need, I think, to acknowledge to that to name timbre is also to discipline music. Thank you.